Hello everyone, it's time for another virtual National Quilting Day lecture. Coming up, we will have Jonathan Gregory, Assistant Curator of Exhibitions at the International Quilt Museum. I'm Laura Chapman. First things first, I would like to thank our National Quilting Day sponsors, the Lincoln Quilters Guild, Lincoln Modern Quilt Guild, Nebraska State Quilt Guild, AccuQuilt, Orifil, Handy Quilter, Bernina Sewing Center, Cosmic Cow, Sew Creative, and the International Quilt Museum. Now to introduce our next presenter, Jonathan Gregory is the Assistant Curator of Exhibitions here. He guides development and production of exhibitions at the museum. He earned his master's degree in textile history with an emphasis in quilt studies from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln in 2007, and his doctorate in human sciences with a specialization in textiles also from the university in 2015. He holds a bachelor's degree in human resources from Friends University in Wichita, Kansas. Dr. Gregory is co-editor of World Quilts and is a contributing author to various International Quilt Museum publications, including American Quilts and the Modern Age. He has curated several exhibitions here, including covering the war, American Quilts in Times of Conflict, and in The Engineer Who Could, Ernest Haight's Half Century of Quilt Making. I'll turn it over to you now, Jonathan. Thanks, Flora. Happy National Quilting Day, everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the largest exhibition that we have uh, put together most recently called Old World Quilts. And uh, my role in exhibitions, um, as Laura talked about, was making sure exhibitions are produced uh, and end up in the galleries. And we had some interesting challenges for this show. So I'm going to talk through how we uh, uh, managed to uh, exhibit our, these rare textiles in ways that would provide a satisfying experience for our visitors and also uh, show the proper care. So let's launch right in. Old World Quilts uh, includes some of the oldest quilts in our collection. Um, some date back to the early 1600s. So I think almost uh, every quilt in there was made before the United States was a country. Uh, I think there's a couple of exceptions. So we're talking about some very old pieces of cloth um, here's an image of uh, the entrance to the show. Uh, and then I have a few sh shots here of our gallery so you can get some idea of how the final product looked. This is a Palampore that was hand block printed and painted in India. Other Palampores that were made by the same processes in India. Some of the oldest pieces are in this view uh, made from red and gold silk dating about the year 1600. Uh, some a beautiful embroidered piece in the foreground um, from uh, Norway. An embroidered piece from England here on the left. And more embroidered pieces from England uh, here. So You've also noticed there are several different ways we have displayed these pieces. And so um, in a minute, I'll be going through those. Um, but one of the things that we talk about in the field of textiles when it relates to conservation is agents of degradation. Agents of degradation are what it sounds like, things that can go wrong with your textile. Uh, and so the sources of these degradation can be ex exposure to any form of visible light as well as ultraviolet light. Um, also climate, climate conditions, so too much humidity or too little humidity, too high or too low of a temperature. Uh, this fellow scratching his arm because his skin is dry is just a way to say that textiles like to be in the same kind of environmental conditions that we like to be in humans, as humans. Another uh, age of degradation can be pests. There are certain little critters that really like cloth. And we have programs here to prevent them from getting into our collections. Uh, but some objects have damage because they had some uh, pests that encountered them in the past and they have weakened areas. And the last one is something called inherent vice. Inherent vice is a something that's introduced into the textile, a weakness of sort. We might call it a little time bomb that is introduced into the textile while it's being manufactured. So these can be chemicals that are added to improve the performance properties, but in the long term may cause that textile to deteriorate. There's a small image here of 
from a microscope of silk fibers that have broken because they became brittle due to chemicals that were used in the processing of this silk textile. So that's a quick overview of the kinds of things that we have to look for um, and um, damage that may already have occurred in textiles so uh, that we need to um, be sure that we treat the textiles in ways that don't cause further harm. So therefore, our, our challenge for this wonderful show about uh, the early textiles of the old world and how they were, uh, have caused an influence on current textiles. We wanted to display these textiles in ways that did not cause any additional harm, but provide our visitors with a very satisfying experience. So I'm gonna to talk to you now about what we did to, with individual objects. And of course, now you're gonna get some nice close-ups of pieces from the gallery. Um, this is a, an embroidered piece uh, with gold silk embroidery on, on silk cloth and then quilted. You can see in this image that there's a lot of fabric that has been lost. Uh, the silk has deteriorated and uh, what you see is the backing fabric uh, through the open places. The quilting stitches still seem to be intact, but we have the fabric loss, uh, the delicate silk. This piece also has a lot of fringe around it. Uh, obviously it's very old. And there's interesting motifs that we wanted our visitors to be able to see. So our solution here for display was to display this piece flat so that the fringe could be managed so that there was no gravity pulling upon the quilt uh, by hanging on the wall. And then we took detailed photos of these interesting motifs and placed them on the wall so visitors would have some ability to appreciate um, what was difficult to see by standing um, in front of this flat textile. We also digitized one of the illustrations and reproduced it in a large size in vinyl that we stuck onto this uh, black panel in the gallery. Here's that very beautiful uh, but fragile Norwegian embroidered quilt. Uh, also fabric loss in the silk binding as you can see here, uh, probably more so from wear than from inherent vice. Obviously though these materials are delicate, uh, and also a very old piece and this quilt especially has many beautiful details in the embroidery. Particularly there are uh, embroidered slips, which is a, a term that we use to describe pre-embroidered motifs that then are appliqued onto the surface of the quilt. And so we have detailed pictures of these pre-embroidered slips, which were done in China, exported, uh, and in the maker of this quilt, then appliqued them onto the center of the quilt around the basket of flowers. Another thing that was important here because of the fragile materials were uh, to not cause abrasion which could further damage those materials. So in order to position this quilt on the flat mount, we first laid acid-free tissue paper on the mount and then laid the quilt on top of the tissue paper. The tissue paper allowed us to gently slide the quilt into the proper position. We were then able to fold the excess tissue paper underneath the quilt so that it would not be seen. This image from the side shows you uh, a little bit of that tissue paper. Another quilt, uh, and this is one of the pieces probably from the Mediterranean region in Europe, made about 1600. It is yellow silk on the front and red silk on the back. And we would call this a whole cloth quilt. It has beautiful motifs that are quilted in that um, seem to be telling some sort of a story. However, this quilt has some distortion. As you can see along the edge here, it doesn't lay completely flat. Um, the backing fabric is weak, the red silk. Uh, silk also as a delicate material, of course the age 
and the notable quilting motifs were concerns. So one of the things that we did, and you can see here, is we have put the tissue paper underneath the quilt, um, as I described briefly, um, so that we could position this quilt without damaging the backing material. And of course, then we put it on a flat mount so that uh, rather than hanging it on the wall, so that gravity would not pull against these weak fibers and cause further damage. We also digitized one of the illustrations, um, very interesting, um, a man in uh, 1700s clothing uh, playing a gambol, which is a stringed instrument with these uh, dogs or other creatures prancing around. It's uh, one of the most interesting quilts that I know in our collection in terms of its narrative quality. Here's an interesting quilt um, made in Europe, in France, uh, all silk, and you can quickly see these permanent fold lines. This quilt has been folded for long periods of time in the same places along the center lines, both vertically and horizontally. And one of the things that occurred and can occur when something has been folded in the same place for a long period is that it can damage the fibers. Um, basically, and I'll use my hands, to, I hope you're still able to see this, fibers are straight, but when you fold them, they are creased. And if something is creased for a long period of time, that place where it is creased or, or folded has additional stress on it. And eventually that stress will cause it to tear. And so in this case, you may be able to see in the image that the silk has split and uh, the lining fabric or the backing fabric, you can see the interlacing of the weave of that fabric through the split. There were also previous repairs on this quilt that we had to make sure were not um, uh, stressed in any way. So we chose um, to put this quilt on a slant board. We also used pins, uh, silk pins, uh, actually no, entomology pins, uh, so very fine stainless steel pins to pin the quilt to the board uh, right above the areas that were weakest to further prevent any chance of excess um, stress by gravity. You here again can see the previous repair on the left side. It is looks like this tiny mesh netting that has been basted over the weak areas just to stabilize. This quilt uh, is actually just a single layer embroidered and I apologize for the quality of this overall image. Um, but this one has had damage uh, possibly just from improper use or care, but it is unrepaired. So it's a single layer textile, delicate just because it's already very old and weak, and but it has some interesting motifs and we wanted to include it in the show. So our solution was to install it folded inside a case to prevent one, uh, anyone from uh, touching the textile and tampering in ways that might cause harm, but also folded in a way to show the, uh, the most interesting motif, which is the seated rider in the center. Um, this motif of a, uh, a horse with a rider shows up on some other pieces in the show. And so it was interesting and important to show the reuse of this motif. The other thing we did was to prevent fold lines in this piece by interleaving this textile with acid-free tissue paper so that the creases, as, as the quilt rested in this case, there would not be permanent creases developed along those fold lines. This is uh, the edge of one of the palampores from India uh, made in the 1700s. And you can see that there has been damage and it's been stabilized with stitching. Um, so what is seen is uh, in the place of damage is the backing fabric, the batting uh, and the surface cloth is gone. 
There's also loose yarns along the edge of the quilt, so along the area binding, which is deteriorated. It's a very small piece and it's quite lightweight, and so we were able to pin it to a fabric covered board, uh, not on a slant. And again, I think that's because we, it doesn't have a lot of weight that um, would be affected by the pull of gravity. So we strategically pinned the board, or the quilt to the board, to prevent excess gravi any more gravitational pull and causing damage to that area of uh, repair. Moving on to an uh, embroidered piece from the UK. This is um, quite a rare piece. There are just three or four similar textiles known in the world. Um, so we feel very fortunate to have this in our collection and also the ability to, to display it. However, it does have quite a number of issues. Um, as you can see here, the backing fabric has become unstitched from the front. You can see the muslin backing sticking out beyond the um, this brownish bronze border. Again, we use strategic pinning to uh, stabilize this area where the layers are not fully attached to one another. I don't know if you'll be able to see the pin, but we have inserted a pin near to that bronze colored border and we try to insert it into a place where there's already a hole in the textile. So like um, into a quilting stitch where the quilter's needle has already pierced those fabrics. We don't want to make additional holes in the textile. You can see here as well that the binding uh, uh, material uh, is actually a a woven tape. In this case, it is metal wrapped threads that are have been woven into this tape and then applied to the edge as a binding. But the interlacing has begun to deteriorate for some reason, and uh, the longest metal, the long metal wrapped threads have also broken. So we wanted to be sure that this area was undisturbed. Uh, in the display of the piece. So um, we have used a slant board uh, we, about 20 degrees from vertical and the piece is pinned to the board uh, along the top especially and then uh, carefully in a few other places uh, but not over pinned so that um, any of the natural shape of the textile um, is disturbed. There are some textiles that they have um, uh, some, they're not completely flat. They have some rippling and it is, could be damaging to a textile if we try to pin it in a way to um, distort the piece back into a semblance of being flat. So we resist that and allow the piece to have the shape that it has while fully supporting it. Uh, here is another Palampore from India that has uh, what I believe was a uh, binding that was on the bias and it was made from two different fibers, a cotton fiber and a silk fiber. And one of the fibers has deteriorated, the other has not, leaving this binding that just, um, just looks like a lot of threads running the same direction. So again, to keep this piece stable, um, we have pinned to a board through the strong areas in the textile, through holes that were already there from quilting stitches. Uh, I just mentioned about the natural distortion of a quilt. This is an embroidered piece from the UK. It's a whole cloth, uh, white stitching on white material. And uh, this is a piece where we had planned how to hang it. Uh, it's, it's quite strong, even in, in spite of its age. And so we were able to hang it vertically. We were not concerned that gravity would cause further harm or any harm to the piece. 
However, we noticed this distortion and realized that um, our assessment was incomplete and that there was going to be extra stress on certain areas of the quilt because it didn't lay flat. Um, so we came back um, after the show had been opened uh, with a retrofit with a new um, slant board to fully support the quilt. And we were able to um, allow the quilt to come back to its normal um, shape by adjusting the way the quilt was, um, the, the quilt, the slat that was positioned inside the sleeve. We were able to adjust that to allow uh, basically uh, a curved slat to uh, take out some of that fullness without causing any distortion. So to bring it back to its normal shape. One um, sort of additional piece of information here is how we have used different angles uh, on our slant boards to, uh, for different types of pieces. So the more fragile a piece was, the lower the slant would be, the more closer to horizontal. And so on the left, you see this English embroidered piece. Um, while it was, had weaknesses, it still was overall quite strong. Um, but on the left, we have a piece that was made in India and exported to Holland um, that was much weaker and uh, it needed more support, but it wasn't as weak as other pieces which needed a flat mount. So we made decisions based um, on the condition of the textile, um, wanting to show pieces as close to vertical as possible because visitors can enjoy those pieces most when they can see it uh, right in front of them. So we um, had to make these choices, these compromises and trade-offs uh, in order to make the best experience for visitors without causing any harm to the textiles. Um, that's the end of my presentation. I thank you for listening in on National Quilting Day, and I hope that um, you listen to some of the other presentations, because I will. Bye-bye.